everyone, welcome back to the Are We Nearly There Yet podcast. My name is Sonia and each week on the podcast I'm having a different conversation with someone about a different aspect of parenting and family life. I'm really excited for you to hear this conversation that I had this week with Wendy Jackson. Wendy's a great lady, she has got adult children who live the other side of the pond in America. Uh, she's also a counsellor and through her experience with maybe a more trickier relationship with her parents growing up, she's really able to give us an insight both professionally and personally into how those relationships can impact us as parents now. So why don't you make yourself a drink, get yourself comfortable or if you're listening while you get along doing something else, we hope you really enjoy this week's conversation. So welcome to the podcast to Wendy. It's lovely to have you with me this week, Wendy. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Thank you for asking. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, because some people might not know who you are. Uh, So my name's Wendy Jackson. I'm from the United States, as you can tell from my accent, but been living in the UK for about 14 years. Oh, wow. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Have uh, lived here with my husband, Rick, and our uh, two children live in the United States in Portland, Oregon. Um, Our son is engaged to be married. Uh, so there's five of us now, not just four. Yeah. And um, trying to think what else. Um, so they're adult children, obviously. He's adult getting... children. Uh, Carly is 26 and Ross is 29. They've spent part of their life here in the UK uh, and part in the US. Uh, okay. In particular, our daughter has spent quite a lot of time uh, living in the UK. Mm-hmm. And uh, we all kind of have that, what we call third culture mentality of we're not quite American, but we're not quite British either. We're no, okay. Here yeah. Here and there. Yeah. So that's your family. I, I've known you a few years now. We knew each other in my previous role. And then when I started working at Kerith, I remember telling you in one of my last sessions with you that I was going to be uh, taking up a job at Kerith Community Church. And at that point, we didn't realize that we both well, part of Kerith Community Church, right. <laughs> part of the Blackwater Valley that was then Sandhurst site. And which site are you part of? Your uh, Bracknell. Bracknell site. So, yeah. So it's great to have you with us. So the Bracknell Kerith will all, will all know who you are, I'm sure, if they're listening to this. Um, but, yeah, you told us a bit about your family. Who, were fa- who was family to you when you were growing up, Wendy? So I grew up in a family of five, three sisters, mom and dad. Um, when I was young, we had you know, big extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents. Uh, And somewhere around the age of 13, uh, that kind of fell apart. Uh, My parents were good parents of young children, but not so good as we got older. And uh, their relationships kind of got strained. And so we had really strained relationships with uh, the extended members of our family. And so pretty much from the age of 13 forward, I've always found family in other places. Okay. So kind of groups of friends. I think it's really important for me, that family feeling that my friends know my friends and that there's kind of, I'd say like a cross section where they have their friendships separate from my friendship and that feels like family to me that everybody is kind of interconnected and supportive in that way and so pretty much from the time of 13 wherever i've been i've formed that kind of a a group and that's been really supportive and now actually um well i'm married now for almost 35 years and my husband's family is wonderful and a great example of how families behave and um, support one another. And so I'd say family to me is the Jackson family and uh, my two cousins, my two adult cousins, obviously, because we're all in our 50s now, and their families. uh, We actually call ourselves the A-team and we're kind of the remnant of family that behave like family. And we have that together. We have where our children are friends with each other and have special relationships with all of us and back and forth and you know we're there for important important events in each other's lives and um that's nice and we've kind of taken the best of what we grew up with left the rest behind and given that to our children and so yeah 
So that's family to me. It's so precious. Uh, friendships like that that do become family. I've got friends that we call one another fram family. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's what it, yeah. It's like I like that, yeah. Chosen family, isn't it? As well as your um, given family. Uh, yeah, I know my, um, my dear friend Elizabeth, my kids call her Aunt Elizabeth and Uncle yeah. Ray. That's, yeah. um, they were eight and 11 when they met them. And that just has been natural and they've been there yeah. for graduations and important events and yes. yeah, family, so, as you say. <laughs> where were you in the three sisters? Were you the oldest? I'm the youngest. The youngest of the three sisters. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you do. I know you also work outside of the home. What do you do in that? Area? Yeah. So I am a um, counselor, psychotherapist. I studied at the London School of Theology, uh, Counseling and Theology, and then I did some postgraduate work in cognitive behavioral therapy, trauma, uh, mindfulness, and I'm actually right now getting ready to start another qualification as a master practitioner for eating disorders and obesity. Oh, wow. So yeah, you've got a lot of, uh, lot of theory that might back up uh, some of the... <laughs> Some of the real life, yeah, <laughs> real life stuff that we may get into yeah. in terms of kind of parenting and family life. Yeah. Read a lot of books, heard a lot of lectures, seen a lot of slideshows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll do delve into that a little bit in a moment, but I'm just interested to know what's it like living across the world from, from your kids? Like how, how Hard. You navigate that? What, you know, I can perceive what the challenge is, you know, just simply really missing one another, not being able to be physically together. But are there other challenges that, that I wouldn't think of? Yeah. Like, are there? Yeah, it's hard. Things? Yeah, are it's there? hard. I think, you know, it's been, the kids have been back, both of them full time in the US since 2012. And prior to that, this was home. And so, you know, even when Ross was in university at, in the US, he would come home for the holidays. He would come home for summer break. And since 2012 they're both permanently in the u.s when you moved here originally they came with you 14 years ago or so when we first came we all came as a family yeah okay um and then we had kind of an in-between couple years where we went back to the u.s for a few years and then we came back and have been back uh since 2009 steadily and so at that time our son was uh, in university in the u.s yeah. okay. and stayed um, and our daughter finished her education here and kind of, uh, she went back to the States for part of her gap year, just to kind of see what that felt like and, um, mm -hmm. continued, uh, in the U S at that point. And kind mm -hmm. of when we got our UK citizenship, she had to make a decision. Was she going to come back to the UK and, you know, resident here and be part of that? Or was she going to stay in the U S so unfairly to her she had to at you know like age 19 make that decision yeah um and so she stayed and so in the u.s and so she doesn't have her uk citizenship so you know it that's where she is that's where she works that's actually she's yeah. in school right now but um yeah so i think it's most difficult after we've seen them so okay. you know this year has been especially hard because you know, there hasn't been travel uh, back and forth. And so we have not seen them since January of last Gosh. year, of this year. Um, and so that's been really hard. And, uh, and we I were planning a wedding this previous summer and that has gotten postponed um, oh, no. to next summer. And so the year didn't actually, you know, turn out the way we had planned. Um, and that's hard. So I think the hardest times are after we've seen them you know, because we fall back into our rhythm of what it's like to be family and really enjoy that. And, you know, when we go, we go for a period of time and we don't always stay like in the same place. So it's kind of like, like when we were there the last time, um, our kids live about uh, 20 minutes from each other and we stayed in the middle. And it was nice because they, you know, they had their things and we, we saw them every day or, or most days but it was natural. It wasn't forced. It, yeah. You know, we just got together, we had a meal or we went and did something fun or even just hung out at one of their houses. 
and that just starts feeling very natural again and then you come back mm. and then you really miss them because yeah. you had a taste of it and i think yeah. that that's the those are the hardest times and when they struggle you know if something's going on for them that's hard mm. um that's when the you know the parent in you just wants to be there and you know the counselor in me would say that's just really good attachment you know that your yeah. presence is regulating for your children um mm -hmm. whether you have anything wonderful to say or not you just being physically present is regulating for your kids mm -hmm. and so when they have something that they struggle with it's really hard yeah. to not be there and uh i think that's that's tough and and if i'm honest you know i can get a little jealous of you know my friends and the the ease they have yeah of being with their kids and oh, i just went for lunch or we popped up for the weekend or yeah. you know i'm thrilled for them but you know that kind of tugs at me a little bit yeah, yeah. Um, we have a whatsapp uh family chat that is noisy every day <laughs> yeah and it keeps us connected and you know what what we're doing what we're thinking what we're working on what we find interesting so that really keeps us connected and then when we have conversations it's not just catching up you know it's not like that interview how's work how's you know how's your fiance how's school how's you know your roommates you know it's it's not those kind of conversations it's oh i really like the thing you sent me tell me more about that and yeah you know that we're actually interacting with one another and not just checking in yeah so we work hard at that i bet you're so grateful that it's even in even with all those challenges obviously it doesn't re technology doesn't replace that in person being with one another but doing this now rather than 20 30 years ago but absolutely absolutely yeah I imagine grateful that. grateful for that i think uh, we just celebrated american thanksgiving oh yeah and we did that with my husband's family on a conference call all of us in our different yeah. places and his family has a tradition of kind of going around the table and everyone sharing what they're thankful for yeah. and uh i think technology was pretty top on almost everyone's yeah. list of just being able to see each other and get together and you know, as a family yeah we're more than just us overseas you know uh, we have some family that live in florida which is on one side of the country some mm -hmm. family that live in oregon yeah on the other side of the country some family that are in the middle indiana we have family in uh tennessee uh new york you know yeah yeah all dotted you know even in the states we're scattered yeah and i guess some of us this year whilst we it's only very been very short term but the rest of us who've experienced like a tiny taste of that kind of having to be separate like looking at yeah christmas this year having to be like there's some there's some understanding on a very tiny tiny level i know yeah I, i'm interested to know you mentioned earlier about like a more trickier relationship with your family your extended family the older generation yeah. are your parents still alive and if they are like how is that relationship living apart yeah so um complicated is how i would respond okay. to that um i'm gonna keep this brief because yeah, yeah. you know someday i'll write a book <laughs> um they are currently living in mexico uh in a uh, a town called san miguel which is a uh very much an expat retirement community okay so lots of north americans some europeans that go there the cost of living is a lot less than in the united states and the, the certainly the cost of uh health care as a you know elderly adult Mm -hmm. It's a lot less. So they live currently at an assisted living uh, resort. Uh, and okay. It is a resort <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in Mexico with swimming pools and palm trees yeah. and um, not a bad place, you know, to spend your latter years. My sister is currently living in the area as well. And so that's what got them there. Uh, but complicated. Um, I, I think this is an important parenting thing that I learned my parents were good parents of young children but they couldn't get their heads around and still can't that their children are not extensions of their own person 
their children are individuals and that that we don't necessarily agree mm. with them or we choose to do other things like move to other countries <laughs> um <laughs> become believers in jesus christ you know do different things that are our lives our yeah. choices and that's very difficult for them they have a hard time abiding in other choices so if you kind of aren't in on the team you're not playing by the rules they can uh sever so mm. they you know go through times of not speaking to any one of the three of us mm. usually one of them they're speaking to so right now they're not speaking to me but they are speaking to my sister but oh. the minute i i push that they'll stop speaking to my sister so i've kind of sacrificed that a bit because she's the one that's in proximity to them yeah and so i'm kind of playing within my understanding of how their mentality works yeah. if i stay away then they have to rely on my sister who lives close by and that must be um very tricky to navigate at any point but especially at distance now i, I reckon there'll be a lot of people listening to this that will identify that you know, our relationship with our own parents isn't always you know sunshine and roses and skipping through. absolutely like i guess the modern day equivalent is it's not like it's not the instagram reel of all the highlights of you know what people yeah. post online or choose to share and and those relationships can be strained and then we become parents ourselves one day like ha i'm really interested to find out from you both from your personal experience but also with your counselor hat on your you know, mm -hmm. professional hat like what boundaries have you put in place and, and what yeah how, how did that influence you in the way you've approached your own parenting journey you and rick with your kids yeah Can you just yeah absolutely um so common and even i would say that you know in counseling we call it the good enough parent right nobody's a perfect parent and sure. you know i know my parents love me i have no doubt my parents love me which is what makes it so complicated and i love them but i think what we have to understand is that we have our experience growing up and we learn to adapt to what we need to to get what we need as children mm. and so if our parents have trouble with something like regulating emotion or um, dealing with individuality challenge things like that that affects us even if they're good enough parents, quote unquote, you know, even if they love us and we feel secure and they take care of us. And so, so it's not even just places where our parent, you know, our, our, we've got complex relationships. Sometimes it's where we, we think about, I have a great childhood and I, you know, have a great relationship with my parents. There's still stuff there that we learned that we want to do different. And I think yeah. with our children, Rick and I have been really clear from the very, like from the time they were babies that they are individuals yeah. and that our hopes and dreams and desires for them may not exactly be the hopes and dreams and desires that they have for themselves. Sure. And that if we wanted a relationship that is respectful, uh, it works both ways. Mm -hmm. And so I think the number one thing is that you show your children respect, even as infants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and as toddlers and as children, you show them respect and that is reciprocal. You know, if I yell at my children in front of others, that's really disrespectful. Mm. If I need to rep reprimand them for something, discipline them, I take them aside. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I don't embarrass them, mm -hmm. you know, so I don't give up the discipline. I just do it in a way that is age appropriately respectful sure and i think that's a really important thing that i learned in terms of how to interact with my children and now i have adult children and they have taught me so many things yeah. you know that you know just by nature of being younger and interacting in the culture that's different they've taught me our daughter is uh has been very involved in uh the black lives matter demonstrations in in oregon in portland mm -hmm. um and understanding what it is that people are so angry about and even teaching us the history of mm -hmm. uh, what brings people to this moment that, you know, they're, they're infuriated enough mm. uh, that they would, they would break things or, you know, wh where they're coming from in that, which has been incredibly helpful in understanding. 
so I think the, that respect from a very early age has allowed their influence in our lives just as much as we influence them. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And they've made different choices than Rick and I made. Our, our son is an artist and he, uh, very talented, uh, published, and uh, we so respect the way he lives his priorities. Our daughter, same thing. She's adventurous. She likes to be in nature. She's worked at national parks. Uh, she wasn't ready to go to university at age 18. And five years you know, later, sh she said, you know, I think I'm, I'm ready to study. I know what I want to study now. And whereas at 18, you know, she said, I can go if you want me to go, but I don't care where I go. I don't care what I do. This is not where I want to be right now. And that was really kind of a wake up moment for Rick and myself to say, okay, are we who we say we are? Yeah. <laughs> you know, are we the parents that respect our children's decisions or sure. are we going to have them do what we think you do at 18? Because <laughs> that's what you do at 18. And, yeah. you know, she's, she's very bright. It wasn't you know, a problem with that. Um, it was just, that's not where she wanted to be yeah. at that particular time in her life. And again, she's really, she's taught us a lot about knowing yourself. Yeah. You know, so, um, so I think, uh, if I, if I tie any of that to a psychological theory, I would say in, uh, it would be uh, transactional analysis, TA Let's for short. And I don't know if you remember, I, I may have actually drawn you this diagram on a whiteboard at some point in our relationship. I think relationship. you probably did, yes. <laughs> but tell us a little bit about it now. We might okay. give a refresher and tell our listeners about yes, it. Yes, here we go. So if Don't test picture, me though, don't test me. I won't, I will not test you. Um, <laughs> fair enough. Um, if you picture one column, which is you. Yep. And you put a P for parent, an A for adult, and a C for child. Yeah. And then you put another column uh, next to that with a little space and you put a P for parent, A for adult and C for child. Um, and that's about how we interact with one another. And so it does not matter the age. The, the theory is, is kind of based on ego states that we all have an ego state that would be a parent, either a critical parent, it could be an overindulging parent, or it could be a supportive parent. We all have an ego state, which is an adult, which is, you know, kind of when we're keeping our cool, when we're being reasonable, when we're listening to the other and communicating well. Mm -hmm. And then we all have an ego state where we can be childlike. And sometimes we are a rebellious child, and sometimes we are a compliant child. Sometimes we're a curious child, sometimes we're a playful child. You know, we have these various ego states and it doesn't matter our age and so what happens is we will trigger one another into these states so if i say uh i think that the example i usually use with clients is let's say i have a five-year-old child and we are um it's morning time and we're having breakfast and gonna you know take the child to school and then i'm gonna go to work and I look at the clock and I go, we're going to be late again. And I say it in this very critical, anxious uh, way. And I say, go get your stuff, get to the door. We can't afford to be late again. You know, school's having problems with it. I got something important at work. Just, you know, go, 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 go. Okay. What that's going to trigger in my child <laughs> is either a compliant child who's going to swallow it all, feel very rattled, go get their stuff and meet me at the door and start their day feeling badly about themselves and upset. That's mm -hmm. how they're going to school. They're in that state. Okay. Oh dear. I've or, got repenting to do. <laughs> <laughs> or I have a child who is a rebellious child. Yep. And the first thing they, they do to that, you know, that behavior of mine is they spill their milk all over the place. Or they go upstairs and they say, I can't find my shoe. 
I can't find my kit. I can't, I don't know where my homework is, yeah. you know, something of that nature, or I can't tie my shoe or, you know, something of, of that nature. That's what I've triggered in them. Yeah. Okay. Picture the same scenario. And what I say to my child, completely age appropriate, but I speak my adult to my child's adult. And I say, oh my gosh, honey, look at the time. We better get moving. We're going to be late. I'll tell you what, I'll clean the dishes. You go upstairs and get your, your kit together for school. I'll meet you at the door. Ready, steady, go. Okay, so what happens? I've, I've spoken to my child. My child knows what's going on. My child knows that we, we've got to move it. We've got to move. Doesn't feel like it's their fault. Doesn't feel like it's the end of the world or a disaster. Feel I've made it kind of a, we're in this Dang. together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're a team. We're in this together. When my child gets to the door, I go, oh, we did so good. We're going to be close. You know, and we feel, how does my kid go to school then? In a you know, even if we're late. yeah. It's so and how, what does he take with him into his day and it, with his, the other kids at school and how he interacts with the, the teacher and how he's been triggered again, right? So if the teacher then says something like, okay, everyone be quiet. If my child's already in that state, what, you know, what's going to happen? And in that second example, they're still a child, but we're talking to their, as you said, their adult child. Their, is that right? Their adult their ego state. So their adult ego state. You know, yeah. It's just that state. It's just that yeah. state. It's not, um, you know, different not to be confused with an inner child. Uh, that would be another psychological model. Okay. Um, yeah, it's good. And, and it's funny hearing you say that. I, I remember as I started out, I, I grew up experiencing more of the first example. Mm -hmm. Became a parent, was very much lent into the second model was all you know that's how we wanted to be that's how we were going to be and that's how we were a lot of the time then i added a couple more kids into the mix <laughs> and then like and i was sitting there this thing thinking oh gosh i know i've slipped more into the first but the first one so what would you say to someone who you know, desperately doesn't want to be that you know but it's just kind of habitual and wants to break those cycles and yeah yeah what advice would you give to anyone well so now we're getting into neuroscience because okay. what happens is we get kind of hardwired that yeah. way, and that is our natural response. And so it's about making a choice. It, it's like learning a Being new intentional. skill. Being intentional, yeah. Being really intentional. And so what do I need to do to be intentional about? Does that mean I need to wake up earlier? Yeah, sure. D does that mean I need to give myself some space or start yeah. a certain way? Do I need to pack lunches the night before? Do, like, what do I need to do? So I'm in an adult state. Yeah. And we are literally the adult as well in that in that scenario exactly and and you know further i would just say you know i would say the goal would be you know if i can keep my adult 85 to 90 percent of the time i think that's pretty darn good yeah um but you know i find myself you know on the phone where i've gotten charged for something i shouldn't have and the you know the poor person who gets on the phone to help me i immediately go into my critical parent and then i catch myself and then i have to go like, I think that's a really important thing in parenting as well. I have to apologize. Sure. I have to say, I apologize. I'm upset about this. Yeah. But I know you're there to help me. Let me, you know, give me a sec. Yeah, um, I, I don't need to put this on you. I know it's your job to help me. And it's the same thing with our kids. If I've lost it, because I'm concerned about being late for work. Um, and I've taken it out. I projected that onto my kid. You know, we're human. We're good yeah. enough parents. You know, it's just say I'm sorry. I'm yes, sorry it's so that. good Even for them. It's, yeah, it's so yeah. good for them. An apology means everything. I didn't Absolutely. realize I wasn't thinking. I was upset myself. It had nothing to do with you. I'm really sorry if I made you know affected your day in any way. Yeah, you know. And it's so it important because we might have grown up having a kind of like. I think generationally, maybe this was more the case in, in years gone by, but that, you know, adults knew everything. The adult, the parent knew, knew it all. Their word was finite. You know, and some people might take that approach, but we don't, we just don't know everything. 
as yeah. as the growing up we don't so just to be really honest and vulnerable with our children and say absolutely wrong and i'm sorry it just models and it models that grace to them and it models you know how jesus forgives us it's like absolutely and here's what happens that kid grows up and then they don't know everything and then they feel like there's something wrong with them sure yeah yeah because they don't know everything and so it, it just makes this horrible cycle instead of understanding yeah sometimes i get it wrong yeah sometimes we argue sometimes i'm sad sometimes i fail like these things happen and if we model for our children how we behave when those things happen then they understand that the, that those things happen and i just want to connect it quickly back to the relationship with our own parents so if any of us have had diff trickier or strained or whatever you know, even if we on the surface we get on great with our parents but there is there is stuff there yeah we can also apply this in that relationship can't we every relationship so yeah. we can maintain our because we might default into becoming the child we are For sure our parents yeah. children we will you know but absolutely and, 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 and the people closest to us are the ones that are going to trigger us because they yeah. know right they know your buttons yeah and so yeah absolutely and i would say you know, when, I, when you ask, like, how do you change that? And I went into like, it's neuroscience. It truly is neuroscience. You're like creating new things in your brain that weren't there before, like yeah. new paths of thinking that didn't exist. Um, it's actual protein and matter, like your brain grows. It's amazing. Yeah. But same thing, now you apply it to your parents. And I, you know, I remember being a grown adult, uh, really close to turning 50 and saying, just starting to introduce things into my relationship with mm -hmm. my parents saying being able to name things and say you know i'd rather you not talk about my sisters that way i'm upset by this conversation mm. and then if you know owning it myself not yeah you know like you have to you do you know i'm upset this is upsetting me and then uh if if it doesn't stop again in that holding my adult you know what i'm gonna say goodbye now i'll call i'll give you a call again next week yeah because what i've learned and it's obvious but it's only really come to my mind in the last few years in a re in a really kind of like relevant way is i cannot change other people's behavior whether it's my children, it's my parents whether it's friends colleagues the only person i can influence in the terms of their act it's the only person's actions i can truly control are my own and I shouldn't be looking to control other people anyway, but absolutely, it's my own response. And actually, I'm testament to you can improve those those difficult, tricky relationships can be improved by the way we choose to absolutely and the boundaries we put in place, can't they? And and what will happen is, if you're keeping your adult, the other person will go so into that. adult. Yeah, they'll be triggered by that, right? And so that will happen. And, and you may be the only person they behave with that way. Because when, when you're not, when someone else is not doing that for them, they can't do it themselves, but they will meet you there. And I, I guess I would just add that is when, when the people you're relating to are, again, you know, when I say good enough, good enough parents, good, you know, good enough adults, good enough, you know, when you're, when you're working, when your relationship is with someone who is not stable who maybe has a, a dementia on alzheimer's um a mental disorder um bipolar or you know borderline personality disorder something of that nature it's that much harder okay because they're not going to meet you they've got something else going on you're and sure. so in in those cases then you're going to really need to deal with your own stuff <laughs> you know get your get get your own your own stuff figure out how that's affected you and what you need to do to make yourself healthy uh healthy boundaries around it and then you make a choice mm. you make a choice and a decision about yes i'd like to have a relationship with that member of my family um it's important to me and this is what i'm willing to do for that meaning as you said i'm not changing them it's going to happen i know it's going to happen so if i want to interact how do i protect myself in those interactions 
and you have to make some decisions. And the decision might be, I don't want to be in a relationship with that person. That may be a parent or a sibling. Really sad. And it, and that sad never goes away. You know, mm -hmm. you don't just get, be okay that you disconnected from a family member. Or you've made a decision that it's important to me to stay connected. But this is how I protect myself in that. Yeah. And sometimes our, our way of protecting ourselves and our way of presenting ourselves and choosing to be our adult in our adult ego state and does influence the other person that, but also it might not, but the point is whether it does or not, we've only, we've only dealt with ourselves. So uh, yeah, that I love, I could talk about this stuff all day, Wendy, <laughs> all day long, but we need to, we need to start wrapping up really. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Maybe we'll have you on another time to talk about <laughs> boundaries and things, but thank you so much. I hope that's helpful to anyone else who yeah, does experience that tension with the different generations within their family or yeah, just helps us in terms of how we regulate ourselves with our, with our own children. So that's really useful. Thank you. I ask a question to everyone when they come on the podcast, yes. as you know, it's called, are we nearly there yet? Because it's reflective of that journey that we're on as parents. you I'm sure your adult children are not still asking you, are we nearly there yet, mum? <laughs> but yeah, reflective of that journey we're on as parents. So going back to when you started your parenting journey, that we take essential items with us on a journey. What essential items would you pack in your case with you on the start of your parenting journey? What things that you know now that you maybe didn't know then? Okay, so this is metaphorical, right? So because some of these things I don't think would actually fit in a secret. <laughs> yes, of course. So, uh, the first would be um, the counsel of people who have older children, yeah. and the, the way you pick the person you take counsel from is you you uh look at their children yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you like the, you like the kid you know you like the way they behave you like the way they interact as a family you've seen something admirable in the in the in the child or the adult child or whatever those are the people you ask questions to sure, so yeah. the okay. for me, it was uh my friends Reese and don they were incredibly helpful the other would be uh, a community of friends around you, people that are have kids the same age, going through the same stuff, people that will keep you accountable, and and not just uh, accountable about like uh, you know I remember a conversation years ago, my kids wanting to go to some Halloween horror thing at Universal Studios in in uh, Florida, and bringing that up with my friends and having to be accountable about what you know what that was all about and so I think that's really important um and also just to like to share stuff to cover each other hey you know can I drop off the kids for a little bit to socialize together to you know do fun stuff make cookies as a group you know that kind of stuff I think is really important mm. and then um I I'm totally a daily planner like a daily planner with like hours if possible <laughs> um and included in that would be when i get to be just me okay that's good you know when i get to whatever me is important for me or interesting for me whether like for me it might be a creative outlet um it might be uh reading whether that be just fiction or non-fiction something i'm interested in meaningful work you know, and again, that could be my job, but it could also be my Bible study. It could also be some community uh, activity that I participate in. I don't have to run it. I don't have to make it up. I don't have to, you know, but just I get, you know, I go um, mm -hmm. and be part of it, you know, um, you know, park run, you know, like me. It's, yeah. just, it's something I do for me. Um, and then absolutely um, coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going wrong. I don't drink coffee, Wendy. <laughs> uh, I remember um, when my kids were little, it was before there was a Starbucks on every corner. <laughs> I had a, a mail order, which I actually do think I, I like did online. It was that sophisticated where every month I would get a box from Starbucks and it would have, you know, my beans in it. And then there would always be like a treat, like a something I wasn't expecting, a mug or a taste of something new. And I remember coming home with, a, you know, a three-year-old and an infant in my arms, trying to get, you know, like get to the front door and there at my front 
stoop would be my box from Starbucks. And I would put the kids down for their naps and I would sit at my dining room table and I'd open the box and the smell of the coffee would just come wafting out. And I would just like, my whole body would just go, ah, like I'm <laughs> there's nobody on me. There's like, this is my time. And a cup of coffee really came to represent for me. Like Fun. that's my moment. Yeah. That's so good. Well, I don't drink coffee, but I managed to, you know, I, I have a bubble bath every once in a while. So there you go. Put That's like my put blank, my blank time. Whatever. There's usually, there's usually a child or, or two that wander in. I'm like, no, out. This is my time. You've got two more than me, I think. So that's. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Wendy. It's been so good to chat to you. Uh, as well. You as well. And maybe we'll come and have another chat in a few, a few weeks' time. So. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. massive thank you to Wendy for this week's conversation. I hope you enjoyed listening in to it as much as I enjoyed having it. If you'd like to find out more about the services she offers, uh, you can find her at surreyberkshirecounselling.com. She also gave me some book recommendation. The first is called uh, Counselling for Toads by Robert DeBoard. That's if you want an understanding, an introductory understanding on transactional analysis. And a couple of other books relating to kind of healing from or a difficult childhood. Uh, one of them is Homecoming by John Bradshaw. The other is Running on Empty by Johnice Webb. That's J-O-N-I-C-E Webb. And one last book for parents to understand the neuroscience behind our babies, children, when their brains are forming. Um, it's called Why Love Matters. And that's by Sue Gerhardt. That's G-E-R-H-A-R-D-T. If you buy any of those books, uh, we'd love to hear from you of how you got on with them. But thank you for joining us and join us next week. But are we nearly there yet? <laughs> <laughs>